Hey, welcome. Thank you for coming. I'll wait till everyone finds a way to a seat. I vowed that I was no longer going to cite people's prizes when introducing them, because really, who enjoys hearing about other people's prizes? And besides, in our bizarre but lovely field, we all believe we can judge for ourselves anyway. I will say, though, that when Sigrid Nunez's 2018 novel, The Friend, was nominated for the National Book Award, most of my friends and I felt sure that it wouldn't win because we'd loved it so much. And books that were our favorites rarely to almost never won those prizes. When it did win, it felt absolutely thrilling, as if we'd all won just for having the discernment to have recognized Sigrid Nunez's talent so long before. In her recent very short novels, Nunez manages to achieve depth without any discernible traditional form. It's hard to even say what makes them novels rather than essays. Their organizing principles are thematic rather than narrative. There is little causality in the plots. If Forrester would have us collapse boyfriends and aunts into one boyfriend and one aunt, she leaves them in. And yet she achieves the depth that absolutely makes one stop one's reading and, and sigh or make a physical sound out loud. I thought what I would do, just for fun, is I went through um, her, her most recent novel, which she's going to read from, What Are You Going Through? I went, I had read, um, I'd read twice because she was coming before, right when it came out. And one of the times I'd read it on Kindle. And one of the genius thing, the only genius thing about Kindle, I think, is that you can aggregate your highlights. So I went to my highlights, and this is how many pages I have of them. I had more, I had so many highlights. It's, it's like a 45 pages worth of highlights. So I thought I would read you a few of them. She is a familiar type. This is all Sigrid Nunez's words. She is a familiar type, the glam academic, the intellectual vamp. The lady is no frump, no boring nerd, no sexless harridan. And so what if she's past a certain age? The cling of the skirt, the height of the heels, the scarlet mouth and tinted hair. I once heard a salon colorist say, I believe it's got to hurt a woman's ability to think if she has gray hair. Everything says, I'm still fuckable. Here's another great line. Now who doesn't love eyewear? Um, she can go from that register to the absolutely serious and tragic in, in this novel, and she does so several times and back again. Um, here's a, um, her talking about a mother and a daughter. I guess that's what happens when you bring a monster in the world, was how she'd joke about it later. When my friend began a sentence, if I had known how it would be, I was certain she'd go on. I would never have had a child, but I would have tried to have had one, but I would have tried to have at least one more, was what she actually said. She just doesn't feel like mine, which never failed to chill me. Another line, another random highlight. The only thing harder than seeing yourself grow old is seeing the people you loved grow old. Now, I would, I would read you more highlights, but I had to stop because at a certain point, uh, Kindle told me that this export will exceed the 10% limit set by the publisher by 4.91%. New, new notes will exceed, that exceed the limit will not be exported. So here's to a novel that you cannot stop underlining. Um, welcome and thank you so much to Sigrid Nunez. Thank you, Mona, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, Department of English, UCLA, and Hammer Museum for inviting me to be here tonight. And thank all of you for being here. 
so yes, I'm going to be reading from What Are You Going Through, my most recent novel. Uh, there, there are two main characters, two women, both in their 60s, um, the narrator and her friend who is a journalist. Um, and the friend ha uh, has learned that she has terminal cancer and she is aware that there, there is no hope for her. And therefore she's decided she wants to choose her own time to die and to this end she has procured some euthanasia drugs. And what she wants to do is she wants to go away somewhere for about a month and take care of some last things. She's single, she has a daughter, uh, but her daughter uh, is not the person that she would want to have with her at this time uh, because they have never gotten along and they've been estranged for quite a while, but she does need to have somebody there with her not to help her die, but just to be there with her for this month. Her closest friends all say no, and so she turns to the narrator, who was a very close friend of hers some time ago when they were students, a long time ago. And though, but though they've, they've always been in touch, they, they, uh, they're certainly not great friends now. Um, the narrator very reluctantly says yes. And so the friend finds an Airbnb that they can be in for a month on a, in a coastal town in New England, several hours drive away from where they live in Manhattan. And something to know, and so they, and off they go. It's something to know about this, this friend. She has a very droll sense of humor. For example, she says to the narrator, I know you won't mind if I tell you that you were not my first choice. And at another point when she sees how the narrator is hesitating to, to agree to this extraordinary request, she says, where's your sense of adventure? And finally, right before they, right before they set off, she sends, she sends the narrator a text that says, I promise to make it as much fun as possible. The house was as advertised, gracious, clean, and orderly, with a few special welcome touches, flowers in the bedrooms, the kitchen stocked with coffee and tea, juice, yogurt, bread, and other basics. Extra pillows, extra blankets, wood for the fireplace, everything appeared to have been thought of by the hosts, awarded by Airbnb the status of super hosts who before leaving for Europe had sent us directions to the house and the code to unlock the front door. There were no photographs we noticed right away. We assumed they'd been put into storage with other private belongings and documents. But the living room was dominated by a painting of a woman who we figured must represent the lady of the house in her youth, a life-sized oil that brought to mind John Singer Sargent's portrait of Madame X. In fact, the painting might have been just that, an imitation of Sargent. A white swan of a woman with an impossibly long neck in a simple black décolleté dress that exposed the top halves of her to mixed bird metaphors, ostrich egg-like breasts. One hand rests on the back of a chair and in the other she is holding a lily, a coy mix of the erotic and the austere. If it really is her, my friend said, I don't see how she can stand it. How can her husband stand it? I mean, living every day with this glaring reminder of how young and hot she used to be. I shrugged. You know how it is when you live with something every day, I said. They probably don't even notice it anymore. True, but I can imagine how every time someone sees it for the first time, they say, oh, is that you? You know how people always say that to you when they see a flattering old photo? Is that you? And you wince because they've just let you know how much you don't look like that anymore. It might as well be somebody else. It's humiliating. It shouldn't be, but it really is humiliating. I agreed that it was humiliating. On the other hand, I said lots of people display their wedding photos from many years ago. 
Well, it's one thing to display a photo of yourself as a bride, but this, whatever she said, it's an eyesore. It throws the whole room off. We could drape a sheet over it. My friend laughed. Oh, God, no, that would be even more unsettling. There were other paintings throughout the house, mostly landscapes or seascapes. In the dining room, a large framed black and white photograph of the house itself dated 1930. I was relieved that the eyesore aside, the house matched my friend's expectations. It reminds me of where I grew up, she said. My parents could have had the same decorator. Not that they'd ever in a million years have handed the keys over to a series of total strangers. How much people have changed. I liked the house too. The arrangement of well-made furniture against just enough polished bareness. Some handsome ceramics, but few other household ornaments. That balance of comfort and simplicity that I have heard called shaker lux. It was the middle of the afternoon. Our drive had been delayed by several heavy downpours. But cheeringly enough, the sun broke through at the very instant the house came into view. On the way, we'd eaten the avocado and tomato sandwiches I'd prepared for us that morning. Now all we wanted was coffee. When we'd made a pot, we each took a mug to our room. We had decided that after unpacking, we'd go for a quick tour of the town, followed by an early dinner. There was a fish restaurant that had been extolled on some foodie website my friend had been browsing. I couldn't help feeling, though, that this was for my sake. Though her ability to taste and keep down food was much better than it had been during her various bouts of chemo, her appetite was anything but robust. I pretended not to notice that it had taken her almost an hour to finish her avocado and tomato sandwich. I had lurched through the past week like a drunk, all my senses curiously muffled. But now I could not have been more sharply aware of everything. The hot light pouring through the bedroom windows, the smell and taste of the coffee, the cloud-like pillows against the bed's sky-blue duvet, the grain of the blonde wood floor where a brilliantly colored kilim rug lay vibrating like a piece of op art. The closet and the bureau drawers smelled of lavender. Downstairs, I'd noticed a different scent, a fruity, astringent tang like a citrus cocktail. Under other circumstances, this would have been a fine place to work but I doubted whether I'd have the concentration even to browse the news. What I'd imagined myself doing instead was streaming movies and binge-watching episodes of all the great TV series I'd missed in recent years and thought I'd never catch up on. I also took it for granted that I'd be responsible for whatever cooking or cleaning or errands needed doing, and which I knew I'd be more than happy to do, concerned only that there wouldn't be enough such work to keep me busy. Best try not to anticipate too much was the advice I'd given myself. Though my friend seemed utterly sure of her decision, not once so far had I seen her waver, at the back of my mind was the suspicion that things were not going to happen as planned. Just because we were here now, didn't mean she'd definitely take the drug. She'd come here to think, after all, and thinking might lead to changing her mind. Maybe she'd decide to put off taking it for a while longer. Most dying patients in possession of a lethal dose of medication, I happen to know, never did take it. In any case, it was far easier for me to imagine that after a week or so, we'd be leaving this house together than that I'd be leaving it alone. I was fully aware and troubled by my awareness that a big part of me, while agreeing to help my friend, had not truly accepted, was in fact apparently powerfully resisting the reason we were here, why I was here. 
A dozen times since agreeing to be with her till the end, I had quailed, had told myself I'd made a serious mistake. It was impossible. In fact, I couldn't do it. Then I would think how equally impossible it was for me to back out. I thought that I should at least tell her about these qualms, to which she had responded that she was going to do it anyway. You want me to do it alone? Because I'll tell you, I don't have the time or energy to go down the list of everyone I know. I want peace. I want peace was something she'd started saying a lot. Where's your sense of adventure? As if that could have persuaded me. In fact, the real reason I had agreed to help my friend was that I knew that in her place, I would have hoped to be able to do exactly what she now wanted to do, and I would have needed someone to help me. In coming days, there would be moments when I would not be able to escape the feeling that this was all a kind of rehearsal, that my friend was showing me the way. It was while I was unpacking that it occurred to me that I should keep a journal. It still felt all wrong to me that my friend's daughter, her only family, was not involved in what was happening, had not even been informed about it. I understood my friend's thinking in this regard and could see how she might be right, but it saddened me and it made me feel guilty as of a kind of betrayal. Not that it would have done for me to go behind her back and get in touch with her daughter, but at the very least, I wanted to have a record to pass on. I thought when the time came, those who'd been close to my friend would want to know what she was like, what she had said and thought and felt toward the end. It would be important then to be as detailed and as accurate as possible, and certainly memory alone could not be trusted. I thought also that sitting down to write about each day would help, as keeping a journal of other experiences, including some very difficult ones, though perhaps none as singular as this, had helped me to keep my bearings. An adventure? If so, it was two different adventures we were on, hers completely different from mine. And to whatever extent we might be sharing the days to come, each of us would be very much by herself. Someone has said, when you are born into this world, there are at least two of you, but going out, you are on your own. Death happens to every one of us, yet it remains the most solitary of human experiences, one that separates rather than unites us. Othered, who is more so than the dying? I should make a list, I thought. I'd made a lot of lists since all this began, endless to-do lists, as Scott Fitzgerald once pointed out, people are wont to do when they're on the verge of a crack up. My way was to make a list, then proceed to ignore it. Instead of ever even looking at it again, I'd sit down and make a new one. But groceries, didn't we need groceries? Of course we did. Tomorrow I'd go grocery shopping. And for that, I should have a list. When I'd finished unpacking, when I'd sat down at the desk in a wedge of sunlight and written out my grocery list, I was pleased to take my measure and conclude that I was in a reasonable state of calm. In one corner of the room stood a beautiful antique cheval looking glass. I will get through this, I assured it and smiling at the serendipitous wordplay, I went downstairs, where my calm was shattered by the sight of my friend slumped at the kitchen table in tears. My first thought was that she had changed her mind. Now that we'd arrived, she'd realized that she didn't want to be here after all. For this, as I've said, I was prepared. You won't believe what I did, she wailed. 
My whole body blazed into panic. Had she, in a wild, impulsive moment, taken the drug just this minute? But she couldn't have. She wouldn't have. I forgot them. <laughs> what? The pills, of course. What else? I keep them hidden, you know, in my bedroom in the back of a drawer, and when I was packing, I forgot to take them out. I nearly staggered from relief. We have to go back, she said. Of course, we can go first thing tomorrow. Not tomorrow, now. I didn't think she could be serious. I have to be sure I didn't lose them or misplace them, she said, her voice rising. I have to know they're there. I have to know that they haven't been stolen or something, that they haven't somehow vanished into thin air, that I didn't just dream them up in the first place. She was clutching her hair in her fists. I was afraid she'd start tearing it out like a madwoman. We have to go, and we have to go now. Later, with the pills safe in their new hiding place in her room, and the two of us at the end of our meal at the exquisite fish restaurant, where we were dining for the second night in a row, I quietly suggested that maybe her leaving the pills behind meant that she was conflicted about taking them. After all, she had remembered to bring all her other medications, and there were so many of them. Fuck you, I am not conflicted. And I told you never to say that to me. I don't remember you telling me that. Well, maybe not in so many words. Anyway, you're wrong. I know exactly what it was that made me forget. Chemo brain. I knew what chemo brain was, but when I didn't say anything, she went on to explain. Memory lapses, attention problems, spacing out, trouble processing information. It can happen even after the treatment stop. It can get even worse after the treatment stop. Cognitive dysfunction, it can last for years, in some cases for the rest of a person's life. I could give you a list of examples, she said. Once, mailing a package, she addressed it to herself instead of the person she meant to send it to. She went to buy shoes, and even though she tried them on, she ended up buying the wrong size. Then she did the same thing buying pants. She kept losing things, keys, wallet, phone. Everything I wrote had to be proofread a hundred times, she said, and each time I found at least one error I'd missed before. I couldn't trust my judgment about anything anymore. 20% to the driver, I'd be thinking. Then in my confusion, I'd make it $20. I wanted to ask her then how she could trust the momentous decision that had brought us here. How did she know that wasn't chemo brain too? And now I'm just going to read one more page, which comes, this comes later in the book. It's about that portrait that they see when they first arrive. Have you noticed, she said, her face has changed. She was talking about the portrait in the living room. We had grown more than used to it. No longer an eyesore, it had become a mysteriously comforting presence. She seemed to be watching over us, we agreed. Like a spirit, my friend said like the household saint. The expression on her face has changed, my friend insisted. She looks sadder. No, not exactly sadder, I said, but maybe softer. The first time I saw her, I thought she looked a bit stern. She disapproved of us before. Now she's accepted us. She's gotten to know us better. Now she likes us. It is soothing, my friend said, to look at her. If you keep staring at her eyes, it calms you. Put a halo on her, I said, and she'd look like an icon. Beneath the portrait stood a narrow marble-topped table. One day, my friend placed a candle there and a small pewter vase of wildflowers she had picked. You've made a shrine, I said. 
It makes me want to pray to her. Let us pray. I dreamed that I was asleep, my friend said, and in my dream I opened my eyes and saw her standing by the bed, bending over me. It wasn't a dream. I saw her too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that beautiful reading. Thank you. You described um, earlier today to some of our students, you described how you began the book with the first, with the first line, really. And at what point did you, did you discover the, premise, the, the idea that, that her friend would ask her to do this incredible favor? Well, I, di I, I didn't really know what the book was going to be about, so... I just started writing, and I began with the first line of the book, which just happened to come to me, which is I went to hear a man give a talk. And that meant that I had already set up some kind of story, because who was I, who was this man, what was the talk, and why did she go? And then I, I started imagining a possible situation, such as the I, had gone to another place where she didn't live, another city, and that was where she heard the talk. But what was she doing in that new place? Well, how about she went to visit an old friend, and she's visiting her in the hospital because she's ill. Um, and then while she's there, she happens to go and hear this talk. And then I had to come up with what the talk was about. And <laughs> Then at a certain point, I decided that the talk was actually by somebody that the narrator knew. In fact, it was an ex of hers. Uh, and by that time, I, you know, I thought, well, uh, there's, you know, what's, what's going to happen? And then it just occurred to me that this question might be asked. I guess probably sometime in my life, it, it has probably occurred to me to wonder, what would you do? if someone asked you to do that for them. That certainly had occurred to me. Um, and it, it's a little bit like the book that I wrote before this. It was a similar idea. The narrator ends up with this giant dog living in a small apartment where, where dogs aren't allowed because her friend has, has gone and killed himself and, and made it plain, if anything should happen to me, this dog should go to my friend, the narrator. Um, and again, it was, what would you do if this happened to you? How would you, you know, how would you respond? What would you do? So that's, that's really how that came about. And then there was just, you know, you had to, I had to fill everything in. Um, what, is the narrator, and it's funny, the, the way you describe that, it's interesting because the narrator seems almost what would you do? You know, one thinks what would you, what would oneself do? But but that, did you feel that the narrative of the character was developed? I mean, did that develop as you were going along too, or did you have that from the beginning? Oh well, that's interesting too because uh, I was not very far into what are you going through when I realized that it was the same narrator as the friend and. Again, I didn't, I didn't plan that at all, but, th but I could see, okay, this is the same, per same age, she's also a writer, it's a first person narrator, and uh, she, she has the same sensibilities as the narrator of The Friend. She does? Yeah, so... But where is the dog? <laughs> I didn't mean she's literally the same. <laughs> oh, actually, it was, there was somebody... Um, there was a review, there, it was in France, okay, and they said, this book reads like a prequel to The Friend. Because of the dog. <laughs> yeah, probably because, <laughs> it, you know, like, it was an interesting, like, you know, I mean, I, I remember when this book came out and various people said, oh, you see a connection, it's like these two books are in conversation with each other, mm -hmm. but 
that I thought was very interesting that they thought this would have been something that happened at another point in her life or something. So, but it, it is not, it's not that absolute an identification, but it's just, it's just very, very, it's very, very similar. So I kind of, I, I had her voice and her way of thinking her, her, uh, you know, how she would behave in a given situation. That was, that was already very clear to me. The humor is, is just, phenomenal given the subject i mean when w that line you quoted which, which is you know you won't be offended if i tell you you, <laughs> you were my worst, worst choice. choice i mean you can't make this stuff up it's just it's it's well you can't but it's <laughs> it's just fantastic um how about the character of the friend of the the dying friend in this book well that i that i did have to develop because that is certainly not based on anyone that i that i know i mean i know journalists i know writers uh, i know people who, who who've had cancer um but she's very specific besides yeah those she's things. right no there's a there's a certain kind of she has a strong personality, and um, I also I was interested in writing about her relationship with her daughter. Again, n no one I know specifically is in that mother daughter relationship, but I do feel like I know a lot of people who, you know, families where where the where the parents and the children are are really not getting along, mm -hmm. and in some cases, have never gotten along. Something's very wrong. And, you know, I find that very, very moving and upsetting and, but also, alas, quite ordinary. Um, so, you know, so I was interested in, in, in trying to imagine, since I myself don't have any children, you know, trying to imagine what that, what that would be like. Mm, it's very convincing and very, very sad and interesting. Um, your your novels, if if I were to say there's a trend, they, they're go, they're getting shorter. I mean, they're they're shorter than they once were, and I wondered about. Yet they feel very coherent and complete, and I wondered if you do a lot of writing that you don't end up putting in the novel, but it's sort of hovering there under the surface. Um, no, not no, not at all. No, I I. Uh you know, I mean, I, st I start writing something from the beginning and then carry on through without making out outlines, without having different, you know, uh, different things going on. And um, I don't end up having a lot of material that doesn't end up in the book. Not, not at all. Mm. Very little. Very, very little. Do you spend time imagining parts of their lives that, that, that you don't touch upon? Because they seem... Maybe every once in a while, I, I guess what, what happens sometimes is that I'll have some ideas while I'm writing and think, oh, and then I'm going to go into that. And then I just don't because it, mm -hmm. it just never, it never seems, it just never seems to come naturally. And then I, I'll even think, but you know, it, it, it would be really a good thing to have that in there. But nevertheless, I can't, I don't feel inspired enough about writing about it. And I think the, the reader will never know that I, there was <laughs> this great part was supposed to be right about here. Um, you know, do they you won't feel know. once you, you uh, Sigrid shared that she to our class that she revises as she goes along. So she writes ten pages, then revises those ten pages until they're really right, and then moves forward. So do you feel that that, that kind of do you feel those choices kind of delimit what will be next? In a way, yeah, and I think that that's that's what I want because yeah. the the thing is that it's uh, so that the ending just comes right, and so and so that I mean because you know it, it you, the, you can you can do so much in a novel. I mean, it can be very long, you know, um, and there are so many th stories that you could tell. There are so many. I mean, it could be endless. Is 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 my point, and. You don't. I don't want that. I want. I want something. You know. I want something much. Uh, you know. Much. Much more concise than that. Mm -hmm. um, you know. I want it to be. You know. Uh, I mean. I. I, I want to have certain digressions. I mean. You know. Where suddenly the narrator is thinking about other things and meditating on something or whatever. But I really. I do want it to be extremely. Con concise mm -hmm. and restrained. So, 
Yeah. Has that aesthetic developed over the years, do you think? Well, well, that's, that's another uh, You've thing. You've always been concise, but the books were longer. Well, what were more what capacious. This, I, I, it was, when I finished The Friend, uh, I, I had this revelation. You would think it might have struck me earlier, but it didn't. When I finished The Friend, I realized that how connected it was to my first book, which was published in mm. 1995, A Feather on the Breath of God. I thought, oh, this is the same narrator, the same woman, the same sensibility, mm. much older. But it is those books are those books are really. I mean, that I realized that that's where that wherever the first book came from. Now the friend had come from, and then what are you going through? Mm. So. Um, the longest book that I uh, wrote, which is over 400 pages, The Last of Her Kind, is a really very different kind mm -hmm. of book. And I did really enjoy writing that. And it required uh, a certain kind of density that the other, you know, these last two books, or, or Feather, did not require. But I, I certainly feel that that's, you know, very much who I am. Let's just say, as of, you know, as of now, I can't imagine. I mean, I do have a new book which is also in the same, the same, the same style, the same narrator. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, exciting! The same sensibility. Yeah, they're kind of a. Trilogy. Can you tell us at a this little point, bit without this, without right. spoiling anything? Could you tell us a little bit about the new book? Well, this 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 one is. I mean, it, I think of this as though again, I didn't plan it. That the, those these three books make a kind of, kind trilogy. of trilogy. trilogy. Yeah, I mean. And because I can't imagine writing another one, there is something. Mm. It's it, this recent one, which is called *The Vulnerables*, uh, completes. Hmm. Seems to complete these so ideas. So interesting. Yeah. So. Um, and you didn't feel that sense. And it and it's it's also you know the same. It's short. <laughs> yeah. But you didn't feel that sense of completion when you finished this one. I didn't. I didn't. Think about it. I, I didn't hmm. think about it. It wasn't a question. It's just that when I started writing The Vulnerables and as I was going along and certainly when I finished it, I thought this makes a kind of trilogy and this, again, without planning it, and this seems to complete this meditation um, that I started with the friend hmm. on, 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 on friendship, on, on loss, on mourning, on death. They, you know, is there another like, animating question, like, what would you do if? Yes. <laughs> well, yeah, actually, there, there is. And in The Friend, there was a dog. And then a cat is important at a certain point, though not for long, but one chapter. And in The Vulnerables, it's a parrot. <laughs> I it's a this. parrot named Eureka that has a very well but the parrot is central to something that happens in the in the novel again oh, it's not that. it's not like it's not like apollo in the friend i mean it's not a but there is a a macaw i love that so yes and that book is coming out this coming in november yeah, yeah. so have you started anything since then i haven't i haven't how long yeah. do you tend to wait between books um, not long at all. This is this is unusual because I finished it last uh, last fall. Um, there's just has been a lot going on, mm -hmm. um, and also maybe because maybe precisely because I feel like that completed this three book thing. I'm not, and I and I can't imagine writing a fourth in the same. Mm -hmm. It, the it same just band. doesn't feel. Yeah, it's not like the narrator has died or anything. But no, it's but, like, but good. It just, I'm glad that. It just wouldn't, it just, I, it's not there, I can't feel right. so, so I So I really have no idea what I would write next. That's mm, the thing. That's exciting. Yeah. yeah, and I didn't feel that when I finished The Friend, I, you know, and I didn't feel, I didn't know what I was going to write, but I certainly didn't feel like I didn't know. It wasn't the same feeling. And then with this, when I finished it, um, I felt like, somehow this could go on and I did but now I don't feel that now I feel like I wouldn't I wouldn't write this kind of book again I don't know what I would write I mean maybe I would but it's I have no idea what I would write now mm, that's exciting I you you said earlier that that Virginia Woolf had at one time been a huge influence and you've written about the the Bloomsbury crowd and um, how how what do you what do you read in that way do you read anything in that way now is there, is there sort of your patron saints that you go back to and read again and again? 
No, no, not in that way anymore. And that was really very much a thing of, you know, when I, when I had no idea really what I really wanted to write or how I should write, didn't, had not really found my voice, did not really have a style, was just trying to write, you know, like her and coming up with this, everything was bad, Virginia Woolf, it, <laughs> none, none of it was working. Um, and now, you know, different books have, you know, there have been, you know, Spoken some kind you. of, in, yeah, yeah, you know, like like For Rowena was was really actually quite influenced by uh, W.G. Uh, Zabalt, for example. Mm, yeah. Um, it's, but you know, now no, not not certainly nothing ever like the sort of overwhelming uh, influence of Virginia Woolf. Or I would actually call it, I, would, I can't even really call it an influence in a way because I don't write right. anything no. like Virginia Woolf. It's, it was a, an overwhelming love and respect and admiration for what a writer could do, for, for what kind of sentences a writer could make, for what kind of beauty on the page. I mean, she herself said, all I want to do is write beautiful sentences. And she wrote some beautiful yeah, sentences. And, and, you know, so it was just to be Im immersed in that. It didn't, it, you know, and to be trying to write like that, but it, it didn't, it's not as if she really, I think of her as an influence in the sense that, you know, that uh, on my style, because it just isn't there. Do you, are you a great rereader, or do you tend to always be forging for new books and new voices and new sensibilities? Wait, say that again. When I... Are you a great rereader, um, or do you tend to prefer new sensibilities, new voices? I do, I'm not, I'm not, much of a, I'm, I wish I were more of a rereader, but it really has to do with time and feeling like, well, no, I, there's so much I haven't read, mm -hmm. but it, but it's so rewarding to reread. And in fact, um, just on the plane and then uh, today here, I reread for the first time in a very long time, uh, Vivian Gornick's Fierce Attachments. Mm. And it was it was just wonderful yeah, to wonderful do that. Book. And of course, there was some things I remembered, but in many ways, it was really like reading the book for the first time. Mm. And I think that most of what I would reread would be like that, right? But as I say, I I, I you know I always I, I tend to resist a lot of rereading because I I, I don't want to miss out on all that I've never <laughs> read. <laughs> and there's so much that all of us have not read. I could go on asking you questions forever, but I feel a little bit selfish, so I feel we should open this up to the audience. Um, if you raise hands, the ushers will come to you with a microphone, and I'll let the ushers pick. Hi, thank you very much. I, I love your novels. I've read the last two. Oh, thank you. And I, this might be a nice segue. I'm curious, too, about your literary allusions in the works, because they're very literary, and you seem to be in conversation with other writers. So I'm curious about uh, the writers that you introduce into the novels, the other works of fiction that, or literature that you introduce? Great question. Um, well, you know, one of the things is that the, the narrator in these books uh, is a writer, um, usually kind of, a, you know, not, not writing during the course of the book for some, one reason or another. <laughs> um, and... Uh, and a, and, a, and a writing teacher, and in, in, and so, what you know? That's what she does. She she doesn't have she doesn't have a partner. She doesn't have children. She doesn't have another job besides teaching literature and writing. She reads all the time. Now she's got this dog. But but the the thing is that um, I I wanted to make that part of her life, which is her whole life really, uh, part of the story. And so you're, it's, these books, you're very much in the consciousness of this narrator, and it is first person. So it's, it was perfectly natural to me that, that she would be you know, uh, going about things, trying to think about her friend that she's lost, and mourning and death, and so on, and the dog, and that she would remember, for example, Ackerley's book, My Dog Tulip, that that would be on her mind. And I wanted to you know, talk about that. Or um, she would remember. She would remember lines that Rilke, Rilke had written that are you know. It, it's always something that would come to her that's you know related to whatever she's thinking. And to me, it was always a way of expanding uh, and connecting uh, 
um, to this to this world of of of, of writers. And not everyone is a writer. Some you know there there are people who are references that are not necessarily writers, but most of them are literary. Um, so yeah, so it just it just became a very very natural part of the process, and I did do it in my first novel as well. Not not quite as much, but it it is there very much. You know, that's why I said, hey, this is very similar. Whereas it isn't it isn't in say the last of her kind. somehow antisocial or that they don't have an inner a life outside of books. So I think that the way that you introduce these other writers and these works, these other works is really tender and also very profound. So I, I, well, it's, thank really, you. it's really successful. I loved it. Thank you. It's also her way of connecting yeah. with, with, with the world. Yeah. Um, picking up on that notion of actual writers that might figure into a, a novel or a story or people who have figured into your own literary life. I, I, and it occurs to me also, you were talking about Virginia Woolf. I, I can't help but thinking of one of my favorite canine biographies, which is Flush, mm. which, <laughs> you know, um, which I adore. But it also, I mean, I just thinking about some of the references and what are you going through, um, uh, you mentioned like actual names, like that you would people that you you might have known and certainly would have met, like Christopher Hitchens or W. S. Merwin, and and also I was wondering if if there is some continuity between what you've written as memoir and what you've written as fiction or novel. Um, if there are bits and pieces of your own life, your own actual life that filter into um, your fiction. And the best example of that, I think, comes at towards the end of uh, what are you going through um, in a reference to a writer who the, the narrator worked for as an assistant. And I couldn't help but think that that, that writer that this person has worked for was an actual person Gene Stein. And so I, I had to ask you, did you ever work uh, as an assistant for Gene Stein or was that a reference to Gene Stein or? Yes, before I answer that, I, want, I do want to keep in mind Flush. Yes, I love Flush. Best. The biography of Virginia Woolf. I mean, it's her least read book. Love it's a that. fabulous book. <laughs> Her um, biography of uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning's Cocker Spaniel, whose name was Flush. Fantastic book. So, yeah. And, you know, so many people don't even know it, ex it exists. Um, at the very end, yes, yes, that is, I was thinking of Gene Stein. Well, see, this is, this is what happened. This is what I mean about the process that I have. I was coming to the end of the book. I was writing the, the last pages of that book. And at, at some point, I had read um, a, a, a piece in The New Yorker, a profile of Otessa Mosfeg, who had also worked for Jean Stein and become friends with her. And in that article, it mentioned what had happened to her. I, I must have missed this. I'm sure there was an obituary in The Times. I did not know that story. Um, and it was very shocking, and I was right there, and my narrator is thinking and looking, and so, yes, so I incorporated that into the end. I mean, it's only a page and a half, um, but, but yes, yes, I was thinking about, about that very experience that I had, and thinking all, it was so long ago, and, uh, you know, and this very sad story about how she died that, uh, that I just happened to read in that profile. Hmm. Are, are there other examples of that that um, you met? 
Oh, I'm I'm sure. I'm sure. I don't. Um, you know the. I mean, I've only I've only written one memoir, Semper Susan, a memoir of Susan Sontag, but um, you know, most of my books, I think of them as as hybrids of a certain kind. I mean, there there's a certain essayistic quality to parts of them, um, and. Yeah, I'm always using elements of from my own life in in these books, um, you know. But I, but I, you know. So yeah. So there's always there's always a blend, and also I mean I think I don't remember who who this was. Uh, and and the thing with Christopher Hitchens, whom I did not know, um, you know, it was just a, a a quote, you know, something that I remember that people had said that it, like any other literary reference that I remembered that somebody had said this, and I thought this belongs here. Um, but um, I, um, I always want that kind of freedom to be in those two, in those two worlds. You know, it is, it is a first person narrative. So a, lo a lot of it is going to read like memoir, even when it isn't, at least if it's convincing. And someone, someone has, has called, say, the lat I think it was the friend, faux autofiction, like he somehow knew this is not autofiction. I mean, none, I did not have this Great Dane. I did not <laughs> I didn't have the parrot. I, I did not help it go away with a friend who wanted to. None of it's. I make it all up. You know, I make everything up. But I embed it in a narrative that, that reads like autofiction. And autofiction, of course, reads like memoir. I'm a very good liar. <laughs> And so people read this and they they just assume it's all true, you know? And but that's partly as I say, because it's in the first person and because the person is my agent, she's a writer. And I mean it's it's natural to feel that. I love telling this story about a graduate student that I had. It was an, a graduate student in an MFA program, he's a fiction, a fiction writer. And at the end of the first class, this was quite a while ago, it was before these these last couple of novels. But my novels are all quite different from one another in, in any case. But anyway, at the end of the class, he said, uh, he came up to me and he said, I, I, wanted, I want you to know, I've read all your novels and I have to ask you something. And so, of course, I thought he was going to say, is, is, you know, is, is, you know, like, did you make, did this really happen, blah, blah, blah. And he said, do you make some of that stuff up? <laughs> <laughs> So, yes, I do lots of it, most of it, almost all of it. So funny. Someday there'll be a it'll get, that'll get incorporated into the biography that 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 you were there at Gene Stein's death. There's this um, the Janet Malcolm little book on 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 the the death of um, Chekhov mm. says that Raymond Carver wrote a story. And yes. he, he put a character in who hadn't been present. Yes. And then the later biographies just took that character, and, and now it's been written into the historical record. <laughs> it's a beautiful story. It's called Errand. Yeah. Oh, it's so, just a wonderful just story a great by story. Raymond Carver. Yeah. His last story, the last story he wrote, mm. or at least his last published story. I really like the excerpt that you read about turning the picture into a shrine because I feel like it has resonances with how you described your writing practice, practice as starting with this frame that you start to fill in, but one that's led more intuitively, um, less with logic. And I'm sort of curious to know how aesthetic experience and your creative practices intersect with this idea of spirituality. Wait, how, I didn't hear the, la the what you said before, that just, re could you repeat the ending, how what and my creative? How aesthetic experiences and your creative practices intersect with spirituality. How is your aesthetic experiences and your creative practices intersect with spirituality? You know, I don't, I don't really know, but I really have to figure that out because I've agreed, <laughs> I've agreed, to, I've agreed to, to give a lecture in Michigan uh, next spring. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
about spirituality in my writing. Uh, I don't know. This is sort of a mystery. I, I received a um, uh, an invitation to um, to come talk, and I could tell that the organization was a, was a Catholic organization, and the people who'd been there before me, like Philip Cly, were. Um, were Catholics, and that's what that was the point. Catholic writers. All right, so I wrote back and I said, "Well, this is this is very nice, but I'm actually not a Catholic. I mean, you know, I'm not I'm not anything. I'm not a believer." And the woman wrote back and she said, "Oh, I'm sorry. I just I mean, your work is so Christ haunted." <laughs> <laughs> And I wrote back and I said, yeah, it, it is. <laughs> um, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. But, I, but I, I, I know what you're saying and it's real. I just don't really know how to talk about it. I mean, in fact, just reading that piece again, it, it occurred to me, you know, that, that how much this is like the icon. This is, this is the Virgin. This is Mary. I mean, that, this is somebody's going to read this and see that this is Mary. That's just... You know, but it never, it didn't occur to me while I was writing it. So, so, so somewhere it, it's there, but uh, I certainly don't, there's nothing, I don't consciously, I mean, like there's a certain kind of writer like Flannery O'Connor, for example, where, where, where the religion is so important that it's, it's all planned and put in there. That's the reason why she's writing. Um, and for me, it's just, you know, uh, I, I, I know that a certain amount of that comes through but I, I don't, uh, you know, I don't, I don't really know how that happens. It just, it is clearly just part of my sensibility. As I say, I've been, I then agreed to, but again, when they wrote me and said, will you come to Calvin and do this talk, I wrote again and I said, well, you know, I, I understand this is, a, you know, religious people coming to hear about religion and, and I don't know, you know, that's not me. And they, and they again said, well, you know, it, it really is. <laughs> It's in your work, so um, I'm going to have to figure that out, I guess, or cancel. Is this no, the I... same event as the Christ Haunted? What? Is this the same group that... that... No, this is, this is, and I even told them, I said, you know, this Catholic organization wanted this, and then they said your work is Christ Haunted, and then they said, yeah, you see, you see what we're saying? Like, like we're all seeing the same thing. So, so you don't have to be, you know, a believer or a churchgoer. We just want you to come and, 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 and give this talk. So I thought, <laughs> all right, this is a challenge. I'll, 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 I'll try to do that, and I'll sort of figure something out. So stay tuned, and perhaps <laughs> there'll be a tape of that lecture next spring. I, I just want to follow up on the Christ haunted <laughs> question, because I read the Salvation City, and one of the characters who is quite confusing, it is the minister figure who's a drunk. So I just wonder what inspired you and how you feel about that figure. Because at first, you know, you think that he's a hypocrite, and then you start to have sympathy for him because you realize that, you know, he is messed up, but at the same time, he seems to really care for the child. So, so I just want you to say a little bit about that. Well, he was, he's a reformed, I mean, actually, he's a, he's a, he, he was an alcoholic, but he's not anymore once the story is taking place. But it, but it is true that I did, I did write a novel called Salvation City, which, which, but what inspired that was, was, was really, again, not about the, I mean, that was, that was about a flu pandemic. I mean, that's the, I just, that was a what if novel. <laughs> What do you, you know, that was where it came from. I thought, gee, what if there was a pandemic in the, you know, what if there was a global pandemic like the, like the, the last great flu, like what would that be like? And then for reasons I don't really know, I decided to place this story in the middle of the country and have the, um, you know, in a, in a religious community and have the, the boy, well, you know, I, I, had, I learned that during the great flu, there were a lot of, a, a lot of, kids were orphaned. I knew that Mary McCarthy, for example, lost both parents in the great flu. And um, what's that? William uh, Maxwell lost his mother. And, you know, I'd read a certain amount of, uh, uh, about that. And so I thought, well, I, I wanted to see what would happen there. You would have a child. 
a boy who lost both of his parents and then, you know, in, in the middle of this chaos and was taken in by an evangelical pastor and his wife. Um, so that's really, you know, that, that, that's really what inspired that. And then I, then I did have to write about religion and how, how they, you know, what, what religion was like in that, in that group and, and the idea that, you know, of the rapture and what was going to happen and how this boy, you know, uh, tries to figure out he, did, he doesn't know what to think. His parents were the complete opposite of that, had their own ideas. He doesn't think they were right about everything either, but now he's in the middle of this world where he's trying to, where, you know, all kinds of things that don't make sense to him are happening. He has to figure out for himself what, what a good life or the right thing or what the truth is. Uh, hi. Oh, oh sorry. Is there no, oh, sorry. Um, hi, uh, welcome to LA. It's such a treat having you here. Um, oh, it's such a you. pleasure uh, like reading your sentences. Um, they're so much fun rhythmically. Uh, and I suppose this is, I, I hope it's not faux pas, but like if you could have any recommendations towards people who lean toward the, towards the uh, portentous when they write, how to like, <laughs> like, like, have the sentences skip a bit <laughs> more than they do. Thank you. Wait, how to, how to, um, how, how, how to, like, let the, let, let, like, like, allow their sentences to maybe skip or to have a little lighter gait than they may have on the page right now. Well, that, that's interesting because I think, I, I, I think it's a, it's a natural tendency to overwrite. That's just, you know, you see, you see it, you see it all the time. You see it in, 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 in students, you see it in published work. Um, I think that, um, I mean, not everybody wants a, 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 a plain style, a, a, you know, an unadorned style, um, a restrained prose. Uh, you know, I, I do. Um, but I can also admire, you know, a certain kind of Baroque prose. Um, but if the idea is to try to, to try to try to tame the prose in some way. I think I think the only thing to do is to find writers who are doing exactly what you're trying to do and just, you know, keep reading and reading and reading them. I mean, that's you know, like if I were if I were trying to um write in a plane, I mean, Kurt Say is one of the writers that I would certainly be reading if I was looking to write that, that kind of st style. Lydia Davis is another one. But that's what, I, that's, that's what I do. I would simply find, you know, but I mean, maybe that's not what, you know, natural to you to write that kind of style. I think it's just a question of, of, of practice. I mean, you, and also of keeping these rules in your head, such as, you know, have I have I said this in the in the simplest way I can say it, and have I made the sentence a, a beautiful, true true sentence? And what can I take out of this paragraph that I've written? You know, you only really want in it what is essential. You don't want anything that the editor could cut, and no one would care. Why is the friend nameless, at least initially? Why is the friend nameless? Well, they, in in the the friend, who is the friend? I mean, they're they're all the only the only character that is not nameless is the dog. Um, the the narrator, you know, th when I, again, this was not, this was not a plan, right? I started writing The Friend and the characters did have names. The, the narrator probably didn't because that's, you know, very often the first person narrator is nameless or the name might get mentioned once. But what about her friend um, in the beginning? Like, I believe I was calling him Richard for a while, just this kind of you know, and what happened was that I had names of characters in there and I was writing 
and it, it wasn't working. I have no idea why it, it wasn't working. And so I took the names out and then I was able to make progress. So that's really the only reason. I don't, I don't have any, I don't have a rule about it and I don't have anything against names in, but I, but I am aware that that it, it is not uncommon now for writers to not name characters or to, you know, give them, you know, call them the girl or whatever, um, or the man in a hat. I, you see, now there is some kind of resistance to, not, you know, not in all writers, but in in some to to naming the characters. Um, I don't think there's like a good reason. It's like, um, I forget, I think it was John Grisham maybe, who was giving some rules to, you know, rules to people who want to write. And I think the, the second one was, um, you know, name, no, actually it was quotation marks, because you know how like a lot of writers, you know, like, you know, use quotation marks. He wrote, come on people, this is basic, right? And I can imagine him saying the same thing, name your characters. <laughs> but... <laughs> I think we have time for one more question, and then Sigrid Nunez has generously agreed to sign books. Thank you. Um, the, um, what are you going through begins with the words, um, I went to hear a man give a talk. Um, and you say you, you often don't rewrite, or uh, minimally rewrite. It turns out 14 pages later that the man is someone the narrator knows. And I've been wondering for a long time why you didn't rewrite that first sentence and why you fooled the readers into thinking this is a first meeting, the narrator is being objective about her attitude towards the man who is giving a talk on a, a multiplicity of crises. And... Um, the man eventually turns out to be a very good friend um, to the narrator. And I, I've just wondered why you've never rewrote that first sentence and where you were going with that. Um, well, first, first of all, you know, it's not that I don't rewrite or revise. I, I do many, many, many drafts. It's just that what I don't do is get the whole thing down and then and go back and rewrite it, all right? I do the revision, the rewriting, while I go along. So if I have that first 10 or 15 pages and then I try to write the hell out of them and then move on and then by the time I finish the book I will have revised it, you know, multiple, multiple times. Um, and that's why when I come to the end I don't have to go back and rewrite or, or revise. So, um, so I wanted it all to happen kind of with the the writing of it. So there wouldn't I, I, there wouldn't have been any reason for me to go back and rewrite that first sentence. I mean, I'm announcing to the reader that I went to hear a man give a talk. Eventually it comes out that this is her ex. But I didn't really feel that there was a need to say in the first sentence I went to hear my ex give a talk. That's you know, I would never have written that. I would never have even thought that. I didn't, I myself, I didn't know it was her ex until 40 pages. You know, I didn't, I didn't prepare it that way, right? So um, I think for me, it's just, it makes it a more, more interesting for the reader, you know? That's why, and I, as I say, it wouldn't have, it would have, I would have had to write a whole other book if I had decided I'm going to I'm going to write this book about this uh, partly about this ex and I'm going to let the reader know right from the beginning that that's who who it is. It's not the only uh, example of that kind of thing. I do I do it all the time. Yeah, because I, I I like the idea of withholding, and not just when I do when I read other right withholding a certain amount of information in a story until a certain point without, without being, you know, too manip, you know, you have to be careful because you don't want to, readers don't like to be manipulated. So it has to, it has to come in some sort of natural way. So that was what I was hoping for that to happen, you know, for, for it to come out like that. 
Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. This is thank wonderful. You. Thank you very much. Thanks for uh, listening. We thank have you. we have some of Sigrid Nunez's books for sale in the back of the room, and she's generously agreed to sign. So we'll perform a line.